Gather around, kids. It's story time. <laughs> so, uh, what are we going to talk about today? This is where somebody like yells something. Oh, uh, great. So, what should we talk about today? Corrections. Market crash. Oh, okay. The world is burning. Oh, oh my. Sell. Everything. Today, we're going to talk about corrections and market crashes. So, let's get into it. I'm Mark Monroe, and this is a come up. It's time to take a deeper look, see what's on the horizon. Check if the earn is out or underperform the guidance. The good companies always striving for innovation, while the bad, short-sighted, often get complacent. But we plan for the future and look for action to take now. So gather around, it's time for the breakdown. All right, so let's just take you through a brief history of kind of like what we've seen across history of crashes in the stock market. So that way we can kind of like, like paint the picture like a, like a Bob Ross painting. So let's journey all the way back to not the tulip crisis or the tulip craze. We're gonna talk about like the start of the beginning. Now, if we think about the crashes in history, we have the 1929 crash, which caused the Great Depression. Then we had the flash crash in 1987. Then we had the dot-com bubble bust in 2000. Then of course we had the financial crisis, which was in 2008. And then of course, one of the most recent ones that we had was in 2000 or yeah, 2020, <laughs> 2020. Uh, was the COVID-19 pandemic uh, crash of the stock market. Now, what do these crashes look like? Now, normally in across history, like if you think about in 1929, we saw a crash of about 10%. So in 10% in, in yesteryear's market in today, that would be very significant. Kind of like along the lines of a 30 to 50% crash. Then we had in 2008, we had the financial crisis, which caused significant drops of about anywhere from 15 all the way to 30%. And then on top of that, we also had the tech bubble, which the NASDAQ literally just wiped off anywhere from 50 to 75%. And then of course you had that flash crash in 1987, which was about 20%. And that was just like, I think that was Black Monday, October 24th, 1929. That was pretty much Black Thursday. It's funny that we're starting to see a recurring theme here, which is interesting, but that's a whole nother other. Where is my team? This tea's still hot. When we look across the board, when we think about like all the crashes that have, like, that have literally spurned through history of the stock market, not including any of the other things, let's just do a quick breakdown of them. Now, of course, in 1987, that was just a flash crash where flash crash where that was led by a computer error. So we don't really count that, but technically all in all, in reality, we technically do count it because it was still a crash. But in 1929, you had the, we were coming off of the roaring 20s, not we, because technically I wasn't born, but you know, the people were coming off an amazing economic boom and bustling economy. And at the same token that there was a huge economic boom, there was a lot of speculation that was being built in. And then ultimately things started to go a little bit further south in 1929 and things just like, we're done here. And then of course, uh, in 2008, we saw a significant excessive leverage that took place, not really in the stock market, but the thing that, but the stock market was highly impacted due to the real estate market, which is very, very rare. But at the same token, you saw folks that were excessively over leveraged within the real estate market, which led to a bubble being busted. Same thing that we can kind of look at in the real estate market. We saw the same thing in 2000 with the tech bubble where valuations were just all ridiculous, kind of like SPACs, but that's a whole different story. But we saw a significant amount of tech companies that just came out of nowhere. They should have been more like you know, companies that were early stage companies that were going through series A or seed rounds, but they were becoming publicly traded. This really does sound familiar. Mm. But anyways, all in all, valuations got significantly stretched to the point where they were completely unbelievable, especially when it came time for revenue and showing that you were actually making any type of profits and that was not happening. Think about things like, you know, you had some of the companies that slightly survived, but not really, like pets.com and homegrocer.com. And a lot of these companies ultimately got bought up by, you know, the juggernaut that we all know of Amazon today, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother situation. We can kind of look at certain traits within the stock market and say, hmm, what typically causes a crash? So when we look at 2020's uh, most recent crash, 
That was triggered by, think about it, supply chains being completely disrupted around globally. And on top of that, manufacturing coming to a halt, we saw supply chain shortages. And then on top of that, we saw jobs being impacted. It was just a complete economic nightmare. Now it just didn't start just immediately. Well, actually, no, wait, it did. Because then essentially we saw a lot of companies have to revise their earnings and saying, hey, we don't know if we're actually gonna do well. And then that caused investors to be a little bit spooked. Now notice something here. There's another trend that you can just notice within that conversation, panic. So one of the key characteristic traits that we see across all corrections, whether it's a small or correction, or say for example, crashes, is the fact of panic. So I'm gonna go into that. I'm actually gonna lay out six things that you can normally look at when we talk about stock market crashes that they all share in common or that they have you know, certain traits in which that they're combinations that go hand in hand with each other. So for example, the first one is say, for example, excessive leverage. So what does that look like? So let's say that if you've leveraged already $5,000 and then essentially you gain 2000, you gain 20%, you say, okay, hey, that's $1,000 and say, for example, gain. Now, if you over, if you go double the leverage, that's 10,000. And then at the same token, that gives you about $2,000 as it pertains to a return. So then let's bring it into perspective. That's on the positive note. Now, if you're on the downside of things happening, then essentially you're just getting diamond cut and it tends to happen pretty fast. And keep in mind, you're on margin. So when you drop on, say for example, margin or on leverage, then that means that essentially there's something called a margin call, which the brokerage will say, hey, we need our money back. Are you good for it? And in order for us to know that you're good for it, we want you to pay it back to us. And so then that ultimately means that sometimes you have to liquidate assets in order to essentially make good on margin calls, or you have to supply the cash before the time being. So that can definitely cause some significant uh, panic selling or just triggering sell-offs. So there's that. that's the first part. And then of course there's panic. The other part to look at is taxes. So for example, and a lot of folks are like, well, Mark, how do taxes play a role? Well, recently uh, we had a tax act that literally came through and like literally alleviated a lot of the tax issues for say, for example, the wealthy or folks in whom which that knew them and ultimately allowed you to get significant tax cuts. And ultimately uh, folks were like, hey, this is great, right? When it's good, it's good. But at the same token, nothing good lasts forever. And so what we're starting to see is, is that with those same type of taxes, it does something. It creates a rising cost, say for example, within inflation. Because if you rise and if you lower in taxes, then that means that essentially that you're able to take out more as it, as it pertains to payroll and all these other things. But then at the same token, people make a little bit less. And when they're making less thing about folks in whom which that are retired or on social security, then they're getting hit with those inflation, uh, those inflationary costs. And remember, social security is very much so fixed. So when you find yourself in inflationary markets, that can cause some issues. So there's that. Then there's political risk. So for example, let's say that somebody wants to nationalize something, or let's say that somebody that runs on a specific platform about raising taxes and everything else, then that can trigger the market to ultimately panic. So that could trigger the market to ultimately panic and then thus cause the markets to go into ultimate panic mode and then ultimately a sell-off ensues and then more panicking and then ultimately case of Rasarat. Now, in some cases, in most elections, you normally see that there's ultimately a fall off before the election because nobody knows exactly who's going to win. And then they typically say that sometimes markets can predict that, but you know, that's kind of like sometimes a misnomer. Some people are right, some people are wrong. So it's like, it's never really an exact science. So what do we have so far? We have excessive leverage, we have panic, we have, it, we have taxes, then there's this thing called interest rates. So it kind of hit the interest rate market for say, for example, the 2008 financial crisis, right? Because imagine going from low interest rates to high interest rates. So let's put it into perspective. If you have a 2000 or if you have a 2% uh, interest rate on your home, and then all of a sudden, the next home that you wanna buy is at say, for example, starting off at 6%, that could be some issues. So what we know of is that when, say for example, interest rates climb, then values ultimately drop. So when mortgage rates go up, value, home values will start to decline. 
And what we started to see within that financial crisis was that exact same science started to kick in along with people defaulting already on their homes because they were getting loans at pretty much, pretty much with no income, no job or assets. So pretty much they were just getting loans at just like a handshake. So that created some significant problems. And then us, and then thus that bubble busted. And then ultimately who was left hanging, holding the bag? You guessed it, investment banks. And those investment banks were, cons were considerably leveraged. And then ultimately that led it back to the stock market because now it's like you got trillions of dollars that are sitting there. Somebody's gotta pay this bill. And the one thing that we always notice about these things is, is that another thing that we can look at, for example, with the, with 2020 per se, was in 2018, though that this is such a rough time for me, at, like I just really hate talking about 2018, but I'll talk about it. In 2018, we saw the yield curve invert. So when we say a yield curve inverts, that means that interest rates, so whether the 10 year treasury, as well as let's say the two year treasury, the two year treasury became higher than the 10 year treasury. Now, normally what it's supposed to go is from short term interest rates all the way up to 30 year treasuries. And the 30 year treasury should always have a higher interest yield. Well, it happened to be the flip side of that. And what happened with that? Well, you guessed it. Uh, the markets panicked and then ultimately it led the market into an overall correction going into the close of the year. Now notice what I just said there, correction, not crash, correction. So let's get some science out. When we think about corrections, corrections are anything that's at the all time high or at the 52 week high or just at a high and it drops anywhere from let's say eight to 10%, sometimes 15% depending on the stock, but that's normally the, you know, the, the case in point for indexes. So whether the Dow Jones Industrial, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or the Russell 2000. So you'll see it drop about anywhere from five to 10%. And then that's typically the market telling you that there's a correction. Now, what happens during this time? You guessed it, panic. Retail investors, for some reason, love to panic when they start to see the market go up or when they see the market go down. But for some reason, they are completely euphoric when the market is going up. Now, when we see a pullback, we see that happen from time to time. You probably see more pullbacks than you do corrections and definitely more than you see crashes because the crashes that I mentioned, those are the ones that are historically the only ones that are significantly on the books for US stock markets. Now, if you're in European markets or in Asian markets, this is a whole nother story. We may have to get to that a little bit later on in our come up series so that way we can actually discuss other global markets. I think that would be pretty interesting, but let's just stick to US equities for now. So then when we see pullbacks, pullbacks are anywhere from 1% to about 5%. I mean, we see that happen. If you look at a 50 day moving average, nine times out of 10, it's gonna touch anywhere from the 50 day, maybe in some cases the 200 day moving average, but nine times out of 10, the 50 day moving average. And then ultimately stocks just bounce right off of it or indexes bounce right off of it and it's just back to business as usual. Here in 2021, which is the time in which that we're recording this video, you saw, if you look at the chart for 2021, you'll see that we've bounced significantly on the S&P 500 multiple times off of the 50 day moving average, kind of like clockwork on a monthly basis. So it's kind of like a trend. Um, so, but when we look at corrections though, corrections are much deeper. They're much deeper and they're kind of like a combination of a multitude of those different factors, like I just said. So let's break it down. So speculation, notice there's always speculation that normally builds up the market. People buy stocks on speculation because of course, if the market didn't really trade or move off of speculation, then really the market would just sit there stagnant every day for 248 days a year, except for four days, which is its earnings, and then that's when it can really move. And that's the part where really you see this push pull or this debate between value investors and growth investors. Well, what is the value investor? The value investor is watching PE, price to book, those types of things, very fundamentalist, like very hard nosed, like, okay, hey, it's gotta, it's gotta be somewhat at a decent valuation that's very close to what we know of as it pertains to earnings. The problem is, is that you can't really keep up with that. And on top of that, it's like, okay, is the stock gonna just stay there? No, it's not. Because people are gonna wanna buy in and they're gonna wanna have a piece of the pie. Now, growth investors, they're like, um, to heck with a, <laughs> a PE ratio for the most part, we look at it on the futuristic side as it pertains to what the company can do over a, over a decent amount of time, AKA discounted cash flow or deferred cash flows in some cases if you're like SPAC. 
So in those particular cases, there's a lot of speculation that's built into those stocks, AKA growth stocks or high beta stocks, high moving, high, high volume or high velocity. And essentially many times those are some of your most volatile stocks. And so it's kind of like this push and pull where we find ourselves and where it's kind of like not on the pullbacks, everybody kind of like gets okay with the pullback, but it's really in between that psychology between a correction as well as say, for example, a crash. How can you determine the two? Well, here's some knowledge for you to understand outside of this whole soliloquy of what I was saying. If you don't pick up anything else that I said in this video, pay attention to this piece. One, crashes don't happen all the time. Believe it or not, crashes are very systemic and on top of that, they happen over a set amount of years over time that there's a buildup. They don't just happen year after year after year like most people would lead you to believe. That just doesn't happen, that's just not the truth. It's far from it. So normally what you'll see is on a yearly basis, every 12 months or in some cases every 16 months, you will see that the market will take a pullback called a correction. A, di a significant pullback is called a correction. So about 10%, the market will literally cut. And so what is the psychology behind a correction? Well, think about it. If I'm an investor and if I bought a stock at say, for example, when it just started in the year, the, the, the first day of trading, and then the stock is up 60% for the year. Okay, there's a point in time where I'm gonna take profit. So if the stock is up 60% and if I'm at the mid year or going into the close of the year, I'm gonna rebalance my portfolio. And this is just purely for the stock investors out there. I'm gonna rebalance my portfolio or say, for example, shave off of my portfolio and take profit if that's my strategy. And if I'm a long-term holder, then I'm not gonna really care because over the trajectory of about 10, 20 years, none of this is gonna really matter. If it's a great company, great index, great funds, then ultimately it's gonna do just fine. By the way, definitely consult with a financial advisor because yours truly is definitely not a financial advisor. He's an investor just like each and every single one of you and I'm here to entertain you by sipping tea and just stating a few facts. This tea's fire. What do we learn here? We learn that a correction and as well as crashes, they carry on some characteristic traits in which that can be similar, AKA their pullbacks and they can feel a little bit, you can feel a little bit tight off of a 10% pullback and you'll definitely feel tight on a 20 to 30% pull, on a 30% drop. But just know this, here's a place where you can pick up a little bit of solace. When you see these things happen throughout history, here's the cool part about corrections and crashes. They don't last forever. They're pretty like systemic, they're pretty like, okay, we're crashing, this is gonna be pretty rapid, and then ultimately we're moving on. So not instantaneous, but they're a lot more sudden than corrections are. Corrections can go all the way out to anywhere from 45 to 60 days, though that we're living in a market where things are happening a lot faster, so they may actually start matching up their speed where people may start figuring out, okay, hey, are their characteristics the same? But one of the things to look at is, look at the timeline in between, say for example, those significant market crashes. Let's go back. You got 1929, you got 1987, you got 2000, you got 2008, and then you got 2011, you can kind of add that in there, but that was more like 7% because of September 11th. And then on top of that, you can also talk about, say for example, 2020. Look at the timeline in between those. And if you get the chance, go pull up a chart or we may just pull up a happy little chart for you here. And where you can see that over a trajectory of time, throughout these course periods of time, the market has still been very much so resilient and has consistently gone up. Why? Because companies gain value. They consistently keep growing. That's the business of being a company on the publicly traded market. So all in all, do we fear crashes? In the beginning, yeah. But if you're thinking about it in the long term, and if you look at, say for example, going through a crash, a crash just gives you a five year opportunity in which that you can literally just capitalize on. Now, of course, some folks are gonna be thinking like, okay, hey, in 2020, we saw the market crash and then it completely rebounded within the same year. And then on top of that was profitable. That was kind of like a misnomer. Don't expect that to be the exact same situation of every single market crash. But what you can do is, when you see market crashes, don't run from them. 
the best thing that you can do is definitely look at evaluating what opportunities sit in front of you, what companies are still great companies and where are they where they are completely oversold and take advantage. That same type of methodology also applies when we talk about market corrections. When the market corrects, look for opportunities in which that you can be a buyer at that point in time. The average person is going to be running away from such investments. Institutions, they definitely don't do that. Nine times out of 10, they're shaving and they're rebalancing somewhere. You just have to figure out exactly where they're going. But if you don't wanna do all that, and if you wanna just keep it tried and true and keep it simple, then stick to what your plan is and finding out what companies that you would like to invest in and literally just go for them when they're on a heavy discount. That's it. I mean, that's literally the name of this game. If you focus on the things in which that are ultimately out of your control, you're not gonna have a very much, you're not gonna have a very big impact. But if you can focus on the things in which that you can control and which that you can have an impact, AKA managing your speculation, not excessive leveraging, staying tried and true and understanding what's happening in the political grounds, interest rates, taxes, as well as understanding the other areas of risk and don't panic, it'll be just fine. And then therein, a few years later, you'll look back and say, I'm glad I made such a decision. And most successful investors always say, I wish I invested more. So those are some of the things that you can look for. And those are some of the distinctive things that you can use as it pertains to defining, hey, is this a market crash or is this just a simple market correction? And where are we in the cycle? The beautiful thing about corrections is, is that it also reiterates the bull market run. The thing about a market crash is we go deep into a bear market. So just again, look for the trends, study up on some of those historical events. Remember the 1929 crash, which caused the Great Depression. Then on top of that, we have the 1987 flash crash, computer error. And then we also have the 2008 financial crisis due to real estate over leveraging. And then of course we had 2020 or 2000, which was also just a journey back a little bit. We had the 2000, which was a dot-com bubble because companies were not at that, they didn't match the value. And then on top of that, we have 2020, triggered by a global pandemic. Notice the things in which that we're able to add as it pertains to how they characterize. So here's some homework. Go and learn about each and every single one of those crashes. I guarantee you, after you're done, watch, after you're done watching this video and liking and subscribing this video, as well as hitting the bell for when the next video comes out, you will also do your research and finding out about what were the characteristics of each of those. And I guarantee you, you will have the solace moving forward as an investor. Until next time, I'm Mark Monroe, and this has been your come up. See you in the next one.